like to just give us an example? What did you do, Justin? Uh, I used one, the number one. You put the number one in for x. Okay, so we'll show all that work. Two times one, right? Got four. No, we didn't. We got two plus five. Nine, seven. Okay, so. What just happened? What did you do? You substituted one for x. Um, mm -hmm. Did the order operation to get the function. And you, what was the last thing you said? To get what? The function. To get the function, to get the output of the yeah. function? Yeah, okay. So we put in one, we got out. And I'll set it, right? Now, Jesper, how did you record that? How did you keep track of that? I wrote it down. Well, what, I mean, you could write it down a lot of ways. So how did you write it down? Did you keep a chart? Did you keep a, did you write Oh, I wrote, two? I like wrote x equals one, and then I put an equal sign. So like one was the input, and then after the equal sign, I put the output. X equals one? Yeah. That's what you did? And then what? And then I wrote equals after that. Equals? Seven. Oh, okay. And then I wrote down, because it was a little confusing, I wrote down under the, uh, each x, or like on the other one, but I wrote down the numbers I put in, uh, and then the answer set that was in there. We're already there. Okay. So this is how you kept, tra kept track of it? Yeah, but it's not a good way. because <laughs> it is false, right, this statement. Uh -huh. All right, what's the same? One equals seven. seven. Yeah, one equals seven, that's not true. <coughs> okay, and that's, that, that's a really common thing, when people were working, horizontally and do their work, and then this equals, this equals, this equals, like, none of those things are equal to each other, okay? So, um, we'll, we'll back up a little bit there. We'll get rid of that equals, maybe, uh, you know what, we could we could have just put a little arrow there. Okay, now that arrow doesn't mean equals. Really what it means in mathematics, that, that double arrow thing means implied. So that, that could work. X equals one implies seven with kind of uh, understood, assumed seven being y, right? X equals one implies that y will be seven. Okay, so that could work. Right? That could uh, be a way to keep track of it. Um, who's got another input and an output, and then how to keep track of this? Um, I did three as well. Put in three. And it came out as eleven. Okay. And I just did a chart, put X on one side, Y on the other. So just a classic X, Y chart like this. And you put three in, you put 11 like that. Yeah. Okay. This communicates that, that one went in and seven came out. Right. It's not a very standard way, but it certainly does do the job. And that's all I wanted you to do. And perfectly, perfectly fine. This one here, this is a pretty standard way. We've seen it. We call it a T chart or input output chart. Whatever. Who has a different way of keeping track? structure of that reverse pyramid, uh, we can tell at the beginning is our input, that's negative five, and the output, oh, sorry, negative five. We could use Justin's method and put a negative five here, a negative five here. We could use Jethro's method, we could say x equals negative five implies we get a negative five, all right? These are all ways of just keeping track of what went into the function and what came out of the function. Yeah, that's, that's the thing about functions. That's really all we do with functions. 
I mean, we can solve for certain values, but that's all functions do, and that's all that we do with them. We ask them to take things in, and then we say, what came out of the function, and then it tells us. Or we say, this is what I think comes out of the function, what had to go into the function in order to make that happen, all right? And that's where we solve equations. Okay? That's really what we're doing. We're saying, here's this expression. Uh, what I want out of the expression is this number to come out, like say for this one, I want negative five to come out, and work our way backwards. That's what solving an equation is to figure out what the input is. Let's come over here, let's do a couple of examples for this one. It's got a little bit more to it. Okay. We'll move on. And in a, probably next time, we'll come back to these as well and see some standard ways of keeping track and how graphs are not as scary as they might sound. All right, so who's got an input for this function and corresponding output? Didn't do that homework. Did that. Sean, what's that? Four. Four. You put four in. Okay. So everywhere we see a, uh, an x, we put in four. Y equals four squared. Uh, a good tip for making these substitutions, for making these inputs, would be just replace x with parentheses, just a blank spot. For something to go. That's really what x is. X is just a blank spot for something to go. That's the idea behind x, or a, or whatever letter you use to represent a number. It's just a blank spot. So let's actually replace it with a blank spot, a, a set of parentheses that has nothing in it, and then fill it in with whatever we're putting in there. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit more about this today, but those copies for me? Yeah. I don't know. Here we keep going. Um, let's see, I should, since the square is with the four, multiply the four out by itself first. Okay. Three times four times four is ten. It's two times four is eight. Times six. Uh, we can just put all of this together. We got sixteen times three. That's forty-eight. No. No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're helping me out. I and then uh, 3 minus 6 is 2, and then 6 plus, those together. Sean, do you agree with the 15? Yeah, the 15. Okay. Uh, what way did you keep track of this was the input, this was the output? I just put um, x equals 4, x comma, equals y equals 50, and then I put the answer below that, kind of line them up. Or like the, the next one that I oh, put then, below that. Okay, so then you did another one, you went yeah. to the next one you put in. Yeah. What'd you put in? The next one, I did 5. You did five, and then you got y equals 79. 79. Okay. Somebody else did five. Oh, you did it in your head. What was that? You just did that in your head? Is that what you said? Yeah. Good. Yeah. 79. Um, there's another way, right? We've got one, two, three, four different ways. Okay. When we get into it, we have graphs because we're just trying to keep track of these things. We're going to do it in a fairly neat, tidy way, all right? So we'll get into that, but you're gonna kind of fill in a little bit, because there is more that often gets, you know, mistakes get made, and I just wanna go over those things, okay? So uh, we'll just kind of stow this away, probably until next class, okay? And then we're gonna go on to some other things. So we are taking notes, Getting that habit, highly recommend that you take those Cornell notes. And every time you have a question, you write it down. You make sure to get those questions answered, hopefully by me in class, if not by me outside of class, if not by me outside of class, by a new book, by a friend, make sure it's correct. You gotta figure out what those questions are and then find out the answers to those questions.
So we're going to start with rational expressions. And can somebody tell me what a rational number is? What kind of a number is a rational number? Think about yeah, that's a number that ends. Ends is decimal ends. Is that what you mean? Yeah. When you say that. Uh, yes. That can be represented as a bad. Yeah, a number that ends can be written as a rational number. So you're correct about that, but what's the definition of a rational number? When you say we can write it as a rational number, what does that mean? A rational number. Like maybe if you need a hint, just think about the first five letters of this word. Ratio. What's the ratio look like? Three to one. Three to one. And a lot of times we'll write that as a fraction. Okay? Rational numbers are fractions. Rational expressions. Uh, well, a, a fraction, a rational number could be an expression, but when we say expression, we mean there's some variables in there. Too. Okay, so a rational expression. So we're going to look at uh, when can you simplify a rational expression. We're going to start with just a regular old fraction. We're going to talk about why it simplifies, why a rational expression, something with an x or a or whatever in it, can simplify, and then when it can't, and why not. We're starting to do with something like. Um, I like to use the word simplify, because we say reduce, it makes it sound like it's smaller, it's not any smaller, the number is the same size, okay? Right. So, and let's say simplify. How would this simplify? Why does it simplify? I'm going to break it down to tiniest detail like that. Very good. Tyler? Um, you can simplify by three. By three. They both, okay, what about three? They both have a, something, they, have, they both have a common, uh, to have multiple. Close. Like not multiple. Not multiple. Multiple, 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 multiple like a factor. Factor, yeah. yes. That's the word is factor. Okay, so they have a common factor of three. Okay? Now, normally we just cross it out, we divide them over three, we get three, here we go four, and it's three, four. We don't give it another thought. But you know what happens a lot when we just do that and we're not really thinking about what's going on, uh, we confuse ourselves for the future. Okay? So that we'll look at this in a minute, but I ask if you can simplify this rational expression, you might think that you can, and we'll find out if you can, or if you can. Okay? If you're, I, I hope that when you see this, you ask yourself, can I simplify this? You don't just start crossing things out. Okay? I want you to ask yourself, can I simplify this? And if you're not sure at all, you can check it very simply, just by using uh, factorization and multiplying fractions. Okay. Let's see what's really going on here. Uh, first of all, <coughs> recognize that these both have a factor of three, so we're looking at them as factored, uh, with one of the factors being three. Yeah. So three times three and three times four. All right. So as we talked about last time, multiplying fractions, multiply straight across, right? Those nods. Yes. I was thinking you. I wanted to see a nod. Okay, you multiply straight across, straight across the denominators as well. So let's just split these up like, like it's the result of having multiplied two fractions together. So you got three over three times three over four. See what I'm doing there? I'm just taking this, I'm factoring it. I'm taking that, treating it like it was the product of two fractions. Here are those two fractions, okay? Now it becomes clear why we simplify from 9 twelfths to 3 fourths, because what is this? One. 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 What do you get when you do one times a number? You get a number. You get itself. Okay. So that's the that's the big deal there. So you get three fourths. This is just a, a one, so we can just kind of ignore it and let it fade off into oblivion. Right. So how about if we had three x or nine? Okay. So we're gonna cancel out of three. Right. Like a three should cancel. Let's just make sure that we can cancel out that three and we're not uh, making a mistake here. Can we do this? Right. And as you're able to do this faster and faster and more and more mentally, you won't have to worry about writing this all out. But when you do magic things, which you're not sure how they work, that's where you get into trouble. Okay. 
So if we can cancel out that three, it's because essentially we can do this. We can split it up into two fractions, and one of those fractions will turn into one, and then the rest is left. Okay. So uh, three times x, that's what three next to x means. We have three times three, and now we have three thirds times x over three. All right. What happens? That's one. So one times x over three just leaves x over three. We can't do it anymore. Can't break it down any further. There's no other factors to pull out. So we're just left with x over 3. Okay. Uh, how about 4x squared? Let's do 2x squared over 4x. Let's see if we can do this. Let's just work with the numbers first, right? Looks like maybe I have a common factor of 2. Let's make sure we have that. 2 times x squared over 2 times, 2 times x, okay. we can treat this like its own fraction, 2 over 2 times x squared over 2 times x, 2x. This is 1, so we're left with x squared over x, but there's no more that we can do. Are there more common factors? Yes? X. Factor of x. Let's see if we can do this. Can we pull apart these fractions because we can write it as multiplication over multiplication and therefore pull them apart into two fractions? Let's so we got x times x, of course that's what x squared means. Okay, we could do x times two, there's no reason why two has to come first, it just looks a little better, we're used to it. Uh, well, this is x over x times x over two. Anything divided by itself, even if it's just x, put anything you want in for x, five, five divided by what? Five divided by five is one. Put in six for x, six divided by six is one. No matter what you put in for x, this will always come out to be one. So we are just left with x over two. Because we are canceling out common what? Uh, what's the word that we're canceling out common what? Factors. Factors. It's very important. Can someone take the word factor and define it? And let me just make a little rectangle here. Oh, 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 oh. Okay. So yeah, it's supposed to be right. Oh. Okay, so can anybody come up, come up with a definition of the word not function factor? Good, it's a good start. But then how do, I have to define go into, right? But you're you're right. Divide. This is an empty. Okay, so that when you divide the number by the other number, you get a whole another whole number. Yeah. That's good. That's getting more specific, more exact. Uh, and that's a good that's a good definition. If I divide one number by the other number, I will get another whole number. That's good. Um, that's very specific. And you know, incorrect. There's even, like, <laughs> just a shorter way to write it is all I'm trying to say. Okay? All right, so let's start it off this way. Let's just start off. If A is a factor of B. This is how a lot of mathematical definitions go. If this is the thing you're trying to find, or to define, excuse me, to define, then this must be true about it. So if A is a factor of B, then, then what? You can divide B by A. What's that? You can divide B by A. 
Okay, you can divide B by A. That's even, uh, believe it or not, there's a definition of divisibility, and it's kind of the same as this. Uh, and it, it takes, I'll just tell you, and then I won't, I won't, make, I won't agree with this. So this goes back to the de definition of divisibility. When you get into it, division is the same thing as multiplication. It's the same thing. It's just multiplication by fractions, right? That's really what it is. It's easier to talk about division like it's a thing that we do with numbers, but it's really just multiplication by fraction. Okay, so here's what, here's what it is. Uh, then A times K equals B. Does that make sense? Okay. Should we say just a little bit more, though? Yeah, we need to know what K is. We need to know what K is. That's perfect. What is K? You tell me. If A is a factor of B, then what would K have to be? Well, yeah, it would have to be a factor of b, but as long as k is not a fraction, right? It's some integer, right? Then it's okay, yes, k is also a factor of b, right? But if I say, you know, uh, 7 is a factor of 21, then 7 times something equals 21, as long as that something is not a fraction, then a can be accepted as a factor of so let me just say where k is an integer. Okay. That's a specific, meaning not vague. And words like divide are just a little bit vague because we have to define them as well. Okay. So without being vague, it's about as concise as we can be and be very, very exact. So there's no arguing around it. That's what I really like about math. I, even this definition of factor, I love. Okay? I love definitions in math. Because there's no ambiguity, there's no arguing around it, there's no saying, well, what about this? Because everything that you could say what if about is answered by this definition. It's airtight, there's no arguing with it. If you think there is, then you know, feel free. But that's the kind of thing that I really love about math. It's just so, the important thing is that we can write something times something else equals this other thing. Does that make sense? Right. We did it with these last few. Can I cancel out this uh, common factor of 3? As long as 3 is a factor of 9 and 3 is a factor of 12, which it is, we just displayed it and we split it apart and then that factor went away, or that, that fraction. Okay. We did the same here, okay? Is, fact, is three a factor of 3x? Yes, because 3 times x is 3x. And so by the definition of a factor, 3 is a factor of 3x because 3 times x is 3x. Okay? It's a factor of that thing. Uh, and likewise here, can we cancel out a factor of 2? The, it, the question is, is it a factor of this whole thing, of this numerator? Yes, it is. Is it a factor of this denominator? Yes, it is. We showed that by writing it exclusively as multiplication, something times something else. Okay, we cancel it out. Is can we factor out a, a you know cancel out a common factor of x? Well, we can write it as x times x. We can write it as two times x. So yes, x is a factor of the numerator and denominator. All of that, all of those words, leading up to the question here. Can I cancel out that two x and that two? Why not? Okay, the why not is the only reason we can cancel things out in a fraction is if they have what? We've said it several times. Common factor. Common factor, right? That's a really important word. That's why I made a box and we defined it. We got really specific and boring because it needs to be a common factor, not just a common number that exists in the numerator and denominator. Okay? I, I have this. This theorem here, called the crying kitten theorem. Uh, if you do something similar to that, okay, like we have x squared plus 2x plus 1 over x squared plus 3, if you cancel out the 2x squared and just call it 2x plus 1 over 3, then a kitten weeps every time. Somewhere in the world, it's made a kitten cry. Okay, there's a stronger version of this where something worse happens to a kitten, but that's some other teacher does that. It's too strong for me, okay? 
that. Did I see a hand up and I just was kind of ignoring it? Jeff Hill. No. No? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. Okay, so let's let's talk about this. Um, that's not gonna go very well if I can do that. So Rational expressions are a little ways off. We'll definitely go over this again, but we'll see them from time to time, and I don't want you to make this mistake. Right? What are we looking for if we want to just cross things out in fractions? Common we're looking for factor. common factor. Not just a number that looks the same. Common factor. Okay. The question here is, is this exclusively 2x times something else in the numerator? No, it's 2x plus something else, right? Remember, what we need to be able to do, if we're going to cancel out that 2x, is the same thing that we did all these other times, pull out a fraction that is that factor that we want to cancel out over that factor that we want to cancel out. We can only do that when we're multiplying together, right? It's multiply straight across. We don't add straight across. We already talked about that. Okay? See how all that stuff is coming in handy that we talked about the other day, about adding fractions and multiplying and dividing fractions? We can only multiply straight across. And it's only by writing it exclusively as multiplication straight across that we can split them apart into their own fractions and get 3 to cancel 3. If I want to cancel 2x with 2x, at some point, I have to be able to write 2x divided by 2x times some other fraction. And when I multiply this together, I need to get this here. right? In the denominator, that's no problem. 2x times 1 is 2x. Everybody following me so far? What though? Am I going to multiply 2x by to get 2x plus 1? Well, there is something. But it's certainly not any less complex looking than this. It would be worse looking. It would not be simplified. It would be complexified. And that's not what we're looking for. We want to simplify these fractions. Okay. So since I cannot write anything here that I can multiply 2x by and get 2x plus 1, no, 2x is not a factor of the numerator, and so it cannot be canceled out. Okay? And neither is 2. 2 is not a factor. I can't hope that I can do that. Let's just get rid of those x's. In, in the bottom, I would just have, or in the denominator, excuse me, I would have 2 times x. Okay, that's 2x. But again, what would I multiply 2 by? What would I multiply straight across by 2 to get 2x plus 1? x plus 1. x plus 1? Okay, let's try x plus 1. We're going to learn about this. It's called the distributive property. Remember the yeah. distributive property? If I multiply 2 times x plus 1, I have to multiply two. 2 times everything here. If you just multiply 2 by x and not by 1, let me just use the commutative property of addition to show you that can't be right. It's got to be by both things. Okay. If you think this is 2 times x plus 1 is 2x plus 1, what if I did this? Just switch the order of x and 1. 1 plus x. Now it's 2 times x plus 1. This is the same thing as x plus 1. Well, this would just be 2 plus x, right? I have to multiply it by 1 and by the x. Right? Distributive property? Not a new idea, right? No. Not a new idea. we got to multiply it by everything. So, I mean, that's a great, great guess. It's better than shrugging your shoulders and saying, I don't know. Put them in parentheses. Put what in parentheses? Uh, the x. The x over x. And then uh, 1 over 1. Or one over. Okay, so you got, we're here. All right, yeah, get rid of that. Oh, get rid of that. Undo that. And then that just in parentheses. This. Uh huh. With the X. This. With the X. No, both of them. Both of them. <coughs> what? I think it means X over X in parentheses. And then plus one. Put an X here. Uh huh. Oh, like this. Uh huh. Right? Yeah. That's what you're saying. Okay, then, then what else? Because I need a 2X plus 1. Well, we have the 2x there, right? 2x in the denominator, yes. And then plus 1 over 1. Well, they're going to add plus 1 over 1? Yeah. OK. If we add fractions, what do we need to find? Common denominator. This one has a denominator of 2. This one has a denominator of x. So this one, you, I mean, these two guys multiply together, have the denominator 2x. So this needs the denominator. 2x. So 
what I'm saying? And even though, even if we do that, now we're splitting out into two different fractions, and we're adding them, and now they're not even one fraction anymore. We have to find a common denominator to add them back together. See what I'm saying? If we want to cancel things out, if we want to simplify a fraction, we want to deal exclusively in fractions that are multiplied together. Because once we go into addition, then we have this common denominator issue and all that kind of stuff, right? See what I'm saying? But I like that you're suggesting it, but do you understand what I'm saying? No, not really. Well, you don't. Um, so what's your idea here? What, what do you think is going to happen here by adding the one over one? I don't know. It seems like you should at least be able to simplify the two. Now you can. You can. Um, so the, the, here's, here's another thing. What we've just written is not the same as this thing. Okay. Okay. Um, but yes, I mean, you could cancel the two and the two and the x and the x. All you'd be left with is, well, what would this be? This whole stuff over here. When I cancel 2 over 2 and x over x, what number is that? Yeah. 1, right? So I get 1 times 1, so I have 1. So I have 1 plus 1. That's just 2. That's not the same as 2x plus 1 over 2x, right? I mean, it's a good, good try. I need a plus 1. I want to work my way around it. But it's just not the same thing. We could do something like this. We could do 2x over 2x plus 1 over 2x. That's the same. But once we split it apart using addition, we have the two different fractions. We're not simplifying the one fraction anymore. Okay? So this could cancel. We have 1 plus 1 over 2x. Now we just have the sum of two fractions. That's not what we wanted to do. We wanted to simplify a single fraction if possible. Okay. Is that making sense? Or not? Yes? So couldn't you do 2, two, two over 2 x over x? Um, One half over x, or one over two x. One. You said one half over two x. No, x plus one half yeah. over x. But x plus one half over x. Uh, oh, I see what you're doing there. Yes. The question though is, is that simpler than two x plus one over two x? Does it look neater? We got one half. X. Probably not. It doesn't. Now we got a fraction within a fraction. Okay. So um, you're right. I won't go too far into that, but you're right. Because one half would cancel the two, and the X would cancel the X, right? And you multiply it over. But this is what you'd wind up with right here. One half over X is the same as one over two X. And so, yeah. So the point here is if you want to simplify a fraction, it's got to be we're canceling out a common factor, which means we have to write it as that thing that we would hope to cancel out times something else. Okay? Let's try something out here. I'm just going to give you a few uh, rational expressions, a few fractions, and, and uh, you simplify if possible, and if not, just don't do anything. Okay? So. Each of those, just in your notes, so you don't have to turn this in or anything, but in your notes, uh, see if you can simplify this and ask yourself the question every time. If, there, if I feel tempted to cross a couple of things out and then just kind of not write them in the next step, am I canceling out a common factor or am I just crossing out things that look the same? Okay. Just zoom through these uh, first two. Uh, First one starts off simple, and they get more complex, that's the idea. We want to cancel out a factor of five. Start that way. Start by saying, I think I can cancel this factor out. What you're really saying is I think that this factor divides itself and I'm left with one. What I need to be able to do is if I want to cancel out a factor of five, I need to somehow be able to write as five divided by five. If I want to cancel a factor, I've got to be able to 
I don't have to do it, but I have to be able to do it. Write it as a fraction that is the factor I want to cancel over itself times another fraction that when I multiply this fraction by this fraction, I get the original. All right? so let's go across the top. What would I have to put here so that 5 times something is 5x? Right. Just x, simple, right? That's, that's what it is, it's 5 times x. What would I have to go in the denominator so that 5 times this is 125? 125. We can do it. We can write uh, this fraction as the product of two fractions. One of those fractions is the factor I want to cancel out divided by itself. Factor 5 divided by factor of 5 is just 1. 1 times x over 25 is the simplified fraction. Here, let's start with 2. I want to cancel 2. So if I can cancel 2, it means I can write it as 2 divided by 2 times some other fraction that gives me the original. OK, so what do I have to put here so that I get 2 times this is 2x squared? Squared minus an x squared. 2 times x squared is 2x squared. What do I have to put here so that I get 18x to the third? 9x cubed. 9x to the third. And now 2 divided by 2 is 1. When we cancel out things, this is what we're doing. We're taking the 1 factor, dividing it by itself, and causing there to be a 1. And 1 times the what's left is just what's left. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So here we are, x squared over 9x to the third. Anybody have any kind of inklings about what might cancel out? Jethro? X. An x. If we can cancel a factor of x, and maybe more, but we'll just do Go on one factor of x. It's got to be able. It's got to be able. It's got to be possible to write x over x, the thing that you want to cancel, times some other fraction that gives me back to x squared over nine x cubed. Is that possible? What would I have to write here? Just an x. X times x gives me the x squared. What would I have to go here? Nine, nine x squared. So yes, it, these do multiply to make the original. So this is the same as this. And x divided by x is 1, so there's our simplification. But you cannot do this. I mean, you don't have to write this every time. This would be a lot of work to do every time you have to cancel or to simplify a fraction, once, especially once you've gotten good at it, right? You've gotten practice at it. But if you, it's not possible to write it this way, there is no cancellation. This is the definition of cancellation, the definition of simplifying a fraction. Okay. Feel like anything else might cancel here? Another x. If that's possible, and we should be able to write x over x times some other fraction. One. One go here. x times one is x. Nine x. Nine x times x is nine x squared. We did it again. We canceled out something else. An x divides an x. We're left with one. And all that remains is one over nine x. And we have a one in the numerator and denominator. You know you're done. There's no way that it's going to cancel any further than that. Yes, Tyler. For that one, instead of uh, any, yeah, instead of having to do all that, like I keep. Can you just write it out like the uh, uh, like two x squared and uh, make it two uh, times x times x and the eighteen uh, x x x and yes. stuff like that and then you're saying two times x times x over two eighteen. Let's even do two times two. I just said two and one. Nine times two times x times x uh, yeah. times x. Okay. Yes, you can do that. And 2 will divide 2, and x will divide x, and x will divide x. Does anybody see, I mean, you do this, if you do it right, but does anybody see why this method might confuse you when you come over and do this? Jethro? Because if you have x's right next to each other, uh, you're going to think they're, that, like, if you have, in that problem, there's x plus x, if there'd be three x's, you'd think it'd be x cubed. Uh, that would think that'd be a different issue that we have. Uh, okay. To think that x cubed plus x is x, or x squared plus x is x cubed. I think we'll get to that too. Uh, but if you write it like this, it's like a bunch of a string of things up here and a string of things down here, and you just cancel out the ones that are the same thing. You see how you could, given a few months in between practice sessions, think that, oh, x squared should cancel with x squared, x should cancel with x, and in fact, you may think that they should cancel. Okay? So it's not incorrect to do this, as long as you realize there must, must be exclusively multiplication here if we see addition between these two terms. Now we've got something that's not a factor, something that's not going to cancel. Okay? So yeah, you can do that, but be careful. Don't let it confuse you in this situation. 
if you wanted to do this more speedily, if we come over here, you could just say, well, I see there's a factor of two, and uh, there's a factor, actually there's two factors of x, and let's see if I can write a two x squared in the denominator as well. Can I do this? Well, two x squared times one across the numerators gives me two x squared, and two x squared times nine x, that'll multiply together and make 18 x cubed. So now two x squared divides two x squared, and I'm left with one over nine x, and it's a little bit faster that way, all right? You don't even have to write these things all out, but if you cannot possibly, I mean, mathematically write it like this, if it's not possible, then there is no simplification that's gonna happen, okay? And we'll address that here. So we have x cubed plus x plus one over x cubed, x squared plus x plus one over x squared plus x. I was working with uh, a student in here just now, and uh, I said, do you feel like something could cancel out? Yeah, I feel like something could cancel out. What do you feel like could cancel out? And they said x. So here's the thing, the same as over here. If it's true that x can cancel x over here, just like this five cancels five, we have to write it as five over five times some other fraction. Two over two is times some other fraction. X over x times some other fraction. So let's come over here. If it's true, you're just following your, your guess. If it's true that x can cancel x, that means x can divide x. We can write it as x over x times some other fraction. Now let's see the problem. Let's even start in the denominator. Keep in mind, when you multiply this x by the denominator, you have to distribute. You have to do this distributive property, okay? So x times what would have to be in the parentheses to get x squared plus x? Times one. What's that? x plus one. x plus one, absolutely. x times x is x squared. x times one is x, so we get x squared plus x. Okay, distribute it, works out great. Looking good. It's like three out of four things. Death row? Okay. Yeah, but the problem is that uh, you can change x to 1, but you can't change 1 to x and stuff. So when you go up to the oh. top, you can't uh, get x to turn to 1. Okay. You can't get x. So I think what you're saying is you're saying, I can't take this x and multiply by something and get a 1. I can take this x and multiply by 1 and get an x, but I can't multiply it by something here and get a 1. Let's just try. Okay. Let's, let's start trying. All right. Let's multiply it by the first thing. We're distributing it. So x, right, x times x is x squared, plus a one, x times one is x, that's great, it's working out, we're so close. But what would I have to put here, that is simpler than what we started with, so that x times this thing gives me one. Okay, the easy answer is there's nothing. That is simpler, okay? There is a something, I mean you can always figure something out. This times this weird crazy thing will give you this other thing, right? Two times something will give me 14.694329. But whatever that thing is, it's also this weird looking thing. It's a weird decimal number. Okay? Can anybody tell me what I could? I could technically put something right here so that x times that thing is 1. 0.5 but an x form. Right? Sort of, kind of like that. How about this? What? X. X? x times x gives me x squared, right? x times x is x squared. Other ideas? I'm thinking of the x. I see you're now thinking of the shape that I think. What if it was a negative x? Oh, what if it was a negative x? What would x times negative x be? Negative. It would be negative. Positive x times negative x is negative. And x times x is x squared. So we just get negative x squared. But that's a great idea, right? We're thinking, we're trying, but then we're, we're actually looking into it. So it's a good guess, but it works. It doesn't work out. I thought Justin would have this. He had something like this earlier. It would be 1 over x. 1 over x is correct. Let's see. When I multiply x times, you get x squared, x. What happens when I do x times 1 over x? Let's just expand it out. Take a look. x times 1 over x. Just looking at that part. If I want to multiply things together, I'm multiplying fractions. So let's make this a fraction. How can I make any whole number into a fraction so that it's over 1? Over one. So I get x over x, and then what's that? That's one. Okay, great, that, I mean, you, you figured out a thing that you can multiply x by to get one, but now what's the problem? This cancels out, and what are we left with? Something that does not look simpler than what we started with, right? See my point there? Okay. So it's possible to rewrite it as some other thing, 
But this thing is not any simpler looking than what we started with. So, if you can cancel this, maybe write this down. Okay. Maybe like a, a definition of simplifying a fraction. Um, We must be able to write it. We must be able to take the fraction x over y, whatever that looks like. X could be any anything. It could be x squared plus 2x plus 7. It could look like anything. Okay. But whatever it is, we have to be able to, to, to rewrite this fraction. So a times something. I don't really know how we want to write something. Maybe we could put parentheses here. This kind of mystery stuff. Okay. Has to be able to do a times some mystery stuff, and that needs to give you the x, the numerator. And a times this other mystery stuff needs to be able to give you y, the denominator. If it's not possible to do that, we cannot simplify it. We cannot pro cross out that thing. Because it turns out that thing is not a common factor, and only common factors are the things that we can cancel out. First answer, can I, do I, can I simplify this fraction? If so, do it. No. And make sure you're thinking of it in this way. It'll never fail. Right? I'm giving you a, as simple as I can a method that will never, never fail. And that does not rely on how to do something, but why cancellation even works. Okay, so what do you say? Can you simplify this or can you not simplify this? Well, that does can. Okay, got mixed reviews. Yes, you can, yes, no, you can. Okay, so let's say that you kind of want to cancel something out. What do you kind of want to cancel out, Jethro? X. You want to cancel out X. So what do I have to be able to do? Write it as? X over X. X over X times some other fraction that gives me this fraction times, if it's possible to do it, then whatever I write here will be the simpler fraction because x divided by x will be 1. So what can I put in the numerator that x times that thing will give me 3x cubed plus x squared? 3x squared plus 1. Let's test it out. Can I use the distributive property and get exactly the same thing as the numerator? x times 3x squared, that would be 3x to the third, right? Multiply x squared by another x, that's just 3x's we're multiplying together. x times 1 is x. Okay, so we're able to do x times something gives me the numerator back. How about the denominator? Can I multiply x times something and get 2x squared? Nathan? 2x. 2x. Right? It works. So, x divides x, we get 1. And our simple fraction is 2x squared plus 1 over 2x. Can we cancel out another x? Yeah. No. You make a kitten weep if you did. You make a kitten weep. We did try to cancel those x's. And if you're not sure, try to do this. Try to write it as x over x times something. Now we're going to have an issue. Because now I could, I could multiply this 3x by x and get 3x squared. But how will I get that 1? Right? We're back to the same problem we had before. How will I get that 1? So 1 over x. Right? 
You do one over x, but then that's a lot simpler. Right? Uh, and then, of course, I could put 2 down here, 2 times x is 2x, but it's that 1. How do I get that 1? I cannot do that. I can't rewrite this one so that I have x over x times something simpler. Okay. So we forget about it. We realize, no, I got that issue. I can't do that. It's not going to work. homework and it's going to have similar questions on there, okay? We have more to do. Sounds good. All right, Paige. Um, thinking about it, I think I'm going to leave this for another day. So what I like to do with my lists is uh, we go to, we, we put it to some other time or some other list. We don't have a here, but like, we'll, we'll address that in the future. But let's go to X points. Okay. And it's when I talk about exponents, they're really just kind of a order of operations thing, okay? So, not doing that today. These are kind of hard to see. So let me change that. Okay. So we say, what do we say, take like a two minute uh, stretch break or something like that? How's that sound? Let's just do that. Two minutes, I'll time it, and uh, then we'll come back. And when it, when it, the timer is up, you should be back in your seats. It's like a tardy bell. Okay. When it is up, then you should be in that. It rings and you come to your seats, okay? I'm sorry. That was a pretty good throw of that round. I hugged it all the way. I was like, I know, I hugged it all the way on the other side. I just saw you walk. Try to grab it. Wait, which way did you throw from? That way. Oh, what? Yeah, all the way. I was like, were you scared you were going to hit a car? Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a Seconds. That's uh, maybe about how long it takes everybody to get in their seats, right? Take it. Take it. Take it. Take it. to write this out the long way, okay? What does it mean? Like, if I were to just, first of all, what is, what, what is an exponent? It's just a shortcut for what? Yeah, multiplying that number that many times. Right. One day, a guy was writing five times five times five times five times five, a bunch of times in a row, and he thought, this is getting tiring. I would like to shorten this. So he called up all of his math buddies, and he said, from now on, if you want to write 5 times itself 17 times, just take a 5 and then write a little 17 up there, and that'll be our little code for multiply 5 times itself 17 times. Right? Does that make sense? That's not the real story. You just made it up. You might not have caught on to that. But that's, I like to make up little stories that make 
a notation or a problem solving method, the solution to an issue. What issue is this a solution to? Writing something times itself a bunch of times in a row. It gets very tiring when you get a cramp in your hand. Okay? So I want you to write, what, what are we doing here? All these parentheses and all that kind of stuff, what am I trying to get you to do? So just write it out long ways using multiplication. Okay, so that, for example, that first one should be, a times 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 Uh, I may check my phone a little bit because my wife is pregnant, very, very pregnant, so she may go into labor at some point. Um, so A to the fourth, what does four up here mean? It means take A, multiply by itself four times. Okay, I hope you can see it there, okay? As I walk around, I see two different possibilities for this next one. I see this. I also see this. I don't see it. Now, nobody wrote nine. Don't worry. Nobody made that mistake. Four uh, times A times A. Which is it? Are they different? For one thing, are they yes. different? Yes. yes. They are different. If I were to multiply this out, I'd get a 16. Right. So which one is it? What's the bottom one? Bottom one. Bottom one. Oh, it is the bottom one. Okay. Okay. So what does it mean to write something to the second power? Start with that. Is that right? Multiply it by itself, not by two, right? Two is not a part of that. You multiply it by itself. One of these times another one of these, okay? So now it comes down to, you know, I'm trying to figure out, as a student, what are you directing me to apply that to? Two. What is that second power, that square? Four, what is it for? Is it for the number here, is it for four? No, it's not. This is another number that's getting squared, and we square it, and then we multiply it by four. So on the test that we took, I saw a lot of, uh, I said, we put a negative two in there for A. So what did we do? Four times negative two squared. Great, a lot of that, fantastic looking. But you know what happened next? Negative eight squared. No, that's not it, right? We don't multiply the four times the negative two. And not because we know the order of operations. We'll, we'll talk about how I don't like the order of operations as if it was the gospel. It's not, okay, it's just, the way that we do things as mathematicians to save ourselves some time and some ink, that's all that is, okay? But I think it's pretty clear that what the person is trying to communicate to you is take A, this number A, and square it, do that to A, and then what do I want to do? I want to multiply by four, okay? If I wanted to also square four, can you see an example of how I might kind of do that sort of thing? Yeah, Justin. You the same as the five A. Same as a 5a cubed, I need some parentheses. I need to group this as a single number. If I want the entire number for a to get squared, I want you to figure out what four times a is and then square that whole thing, then I need to make it really clear that that is a whole thing. That, that is a number that I want you to find first and then take to a power, right? And again, it's not about order of operations, it's just about communicating things, right? We use parentheses in, in English sentences as well, not just math sentences. We put parentheses around things that we want to group together, a thought that we want to group together. Same thing in math. We group things together with parentheses, brackets, other types of symbols. We group them together because we want to draw your attention to figure out what all this is, and then now you have a number, and then we move on from there. Okay? So, yeah, that square is only for the A. All right. <coughs> Love you. Um, I'll show you what I see a lot here on this next one. I see a lot of a cubed over three. Okay. I didn't try to get, I didn't say write it differently. I said write it out the long way, right? So let's address why this is wrong by writing it out the long way. What is the long way? Jethro and Justin are really just kind of running away with it, Sean. Uh, a over three times a over three times a over three. All right, here's the question. That looks like nine over three. Is that the same as that? No. Almost, Almost. except.
except for denominator. 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 If we multiply three fractions together, we multiply straight across all of them. All the numerators times each other, all the denominators times each other. Okay. Okay. Be careful about that. And on the same note, I see a lot of this. Uh, the same kind of mistake as this. Yeah. Okay, what's the long way? What is the long way? If you're in doubt, just write out these things the long way, even in your head. Should I get one factor of five? No, I should get three factors of five. Because the long way is what? I want to take something to the third. What is the thing I'm taking to the third? Five A. What does it mean to take something to the third? Multiply it by itself three times. Three times. So five A to the third would be five times A times five times A times five times A. So the a to the third, yes, but also five to the third, right? Because we can rearrange these five times five times five times five to the third. All right. They just wanted to simplify that more. Yeah. They did. They either made a mistake, or they. A lot of people are like that, but it's simplifying it more with parentheses. Oh yes, to write in parentheses to the third, I think is much simpler. If I wanted to take a number and plug it in for a, I'd want to plug it into this rather than this. I'd rather just plug it in, multiply it by 5, then do the exponents. That's what I'd rather do. Okay, let's talk about this guy. We're raising something to the third, we already said, it means multiply it by itself three times. What is the thing we're supposed to multiply by itself three times? Justin? Two times a times a. Two times a times a times itself three times, right? Two times a times a times two times a times a times two times a times a. And these parentheses really don't add anything because it's just multiplication, right? So I take two times a times a, and then I multiply by two times a times a. I could do the two times the two, this a times that a, like I could do it in any order I want, right? So I'm saying the parentheses don't really matter here. So what do we have? We have two times two times two, that's two to the third. And a times a times a times a times a times a. How many a's is that? Six. We have six a's. Multiply six a's together. Here's a six. Right? Right there. And we don't really need to get a final version for this, but what does this mean that we're supposed to do four times? Two plus a times two plus a times two. Mm -hmm. Multiply this by this, and then take that and multiply by this, and then take it and then multiply this by this. What do you think is a huge like, it seems like half the people do this, make this mistake. What do you think the mistake is? Keisha? They add two plus a to make it just two a. Absolutely, two plus a, it's called two a. Is two a two plus a? No. Two a is what? Two what a? Um, times a. Absolutely, that's a big mistake. Another one that I see is just two to the fourth plus a to the fourth. It is not. I mean, the short reason as to why that is is the actual result is much more complicated looking than just two to the fourth plus a to the fourth. There's so much distributing and what you might call foiling going on here that it's gonna be way more complicated than two to the fourth plus a to the fourth, right? Here. We've gone through all this about exponents, we talked about what do exponents mean, you don't want to make the mistake of saying two to the fourth plus a to the fourth. This is the number one mistake, the biggest mistake. When we talk about exponents, it's the biggest one. Okay, taking two to the fourth. It makes the, the biggest numerical answer mistakes. It's just, it's bad news. Okay? Remember what exponents mean. If you're ever not sure what to do, just write it out the long way. Okay? There are shortcuts. I mean, there's this thing called the, the uh, binomial theorem that's for expanding binomials. There is a way to figure out, uh, you know, I take two to the fourth, and then I run down from that two to the fourth, two to the third, two to the second, two to the first, two to the zero. And, I mean, but it's so much hassle. And who wants to remember all of that? I mean, it's a neat theorem and all. And, and I think you're all capable of understanding it and even deriving it if you wanted to, but nobody should be forced to do that and memorize that. I think if you want to take two plus a to the fourth, just write it out four times and multiply it out. And then if you're in a place where you want to shortcut that, then all right, there's, a, there's this thing that we can memorize. But the big thing is don't do two to the fourth and say to the fourth. 
Okay. Um, so, if we have raised something to an exponent, what's the exact opposite of raising something to an exponent? Write something down here. It might take five squared. What would be the exact opposite of squared in five? Square root. Right? Yeah, it would be the square root. Uh, so, what's the square root of twenty-five? Five. I mean, what question do you ask about this, and then how is five the answer? It's the or it's to say it this way. Five is the square root of twenty-five because if you multiply five times itself. if you multiply by itself, you get that. Okay, so what would the cube root of sixty-four be? Four. What? Four. Why? Because four times four times four equals sixty-four. Four times four times four is sixty-four. Four times four is sixteen times four is sixty-four. Okay. There'd be nothing wrong with taking out your calculator and just trying it out. Yeah. Two times two times two, no, that's eight. Three times three times three, no, that's gonna be seven. Then you try four, it works. Okay. So it's just a basic notation thing that I want you to kind of practice in your homework. Um, okay. Let's go, let's go for it. I saw this video. Oh, hold on. Oh, I just took the volume down. For much of the rest of the world, you almost certainly learned about something boringly called the order of operations. A set of rules for whether or not you should do multiplication before addition or addition before subtraction to get the right answer on your math test. Except you don't always get the right answer, or even one answer. I mean, is 8 minus 2 plus 1 equal to 5 or 7? And is 6 divided by 3 divided by 3 equal to 2 thirds or 6? The problem is, focusing on the order of operations can lead to ambiguity and obscures the real, underlying, and often beautiful mathematics. A mathematician will tell you that 8 minus 2 plus 1 is really 8 plus negative 2 plus 1, which is unambiguously equal to 7, even though the so-called order of operations standard in the US tells you the answer is 5. If you want 5 for your answer, then you really need some parentheses. But why is this ambiguity even possible? It's because fundamentally, all of these operations are simply different procedures that start with two numbers and combine them in some way to give you one number. Each operation takes two numbers as input, two and no more. If you want to be entirely unambiguous and pedantic, every single pair of numbers in any algebraic expression should be inside parentheses. And then there's no need to know any order of operations. Just evaluate the innermost parentheses first and work outwards, collapsing them down pairwise like a championship's bracket. But it turns out that's not the only way. It's possible to change the order in which you do the operations to rearrange the parentheses as long as you know what the underlying mathematics is. For example, if you want to add 3 plus 4 and then multiply the result by 5, you can either do the addition first and get 7 times 5 equals 35, or you can do the multiplication first as long as you know that multiplication distributes across all the terms in the parentheses. That is, 5 times 3 plus 5 times 4 equals 15 plus 20 equals 35. The same answer. And how do we know multiplication distributes? One way is to draw rectangles, but I've done that before. The same rearranging can be done for exponentiation and multiplication. 3 times 2 all squared, or 6 squared equals 36, is the same as 3 squared times 2 squared, 36. It even works for addition and subtraction. 5 minus 1 plus 2 is 5 minus 1 minus 2. So the true order of operations is this. Use parentheses and learn what exponentiation, multiplication, addition, and the rest are really doing. Then you can proceed however you want. That's not to say that we don't have a conventional order of operations in mathematics. I mean, deciding that we evaluate multiplication before addition allows us to get rid of lots and lots of redundant parentheses. And noticing that 1 plus 2 plus 3 equals 1 plus 2 plus 3, and 2 times 3 times 4 equals 2 times 3 times 4, removes a ton more. But the point is that those parentheses are still there, still implied, just like how 3 minus 4 is secretly implying 3 plus negative 4, 
and 3 divided by 4 is really 3 times 1 fourth. But anytime the result might be ambiguous, you really need to use parentheses. Then you can proceed in whatever order you want. The order of operations learned in school, however, is different. It's a mechanical set of instructions that dictates just one of the many ways you can do algebra. It locks you into a single path through the beautiful mathematical landscape, which, while necessary for a computer whose goal is merely to give you the right answer, doesn't really give any insight onto what it is that you're doing when you do algebra. So while the order of operations isn't technically wrong, because most of the time it'll give you the standard answer, it's morally wrong, because it turns humans into robots. Okay, I'm gonna there. So, yeah, it says... This Minute Physics video was brought to you by Squarespace, the only one platform. He says that it's morally wrong because, like he said, it turns people into robots. You still got four minutes. Um, and that's true. I mean, once you concentrate on how do I do this over, why do I do this, or, or what should I do next, given I know what addition is and what multiplication is and how division works and all that kind of stuff, when you think, what, what am I supposed to do next? It just takes you from a place of freedom and power to dependence on somebody else to tell you how to do everything. Okay? All I have to do is understand the basics of addition and multiplication, really. From addition of a negative numbers comes subtraction, and multiplication by fractions comes division. And it all just follows from there. That is, it, like I said, math is airtight. There is no arguing about it. This is exactly how it should be. Now, the point that he makes is that there is a standard order of operations. There is one. Did anybody catch why we have an order that we follow, that we just all kind of agree on? It gives you a, a moral, I don't like, not a, a typical, a original answer, basically. And like well, that. and it keeps you on track, too. Keeps you on track. Do we need an order of operations? Do we need PEMDAS? Didn't you say there was another way that we could do it? How could we do aggregate communicate that I want this first, then this, then this, then this? Parentheses. Parentheses. Parentheses, the correct use of parentheses would eliminate this PEMDAS confusion. Okay? Um, but the problem with that is if we use lots and lots and lots of parentheses, we're just we're writing a lot. Okay? So there is a standard way of eliminating parentheses. That's what the order of operations is. It's, it's the way we eliminate lots of parentheses. Okay? And the way that we for the most part, in well, definitely in this class, absolutely 100% every time, we'll follow it like this, and I'll explain that in a second. You may have seen it, I've seen it in delays class, it kind of has delays. I don't know if you, you guys have delay. But uh, we will agree to do it this way, and most, most schools in America, I've been to quite a few schools in America in my experience, and I've always learned it like this, but um, it's not because it's right. Just because what everybody agrees to. Okay, and let me just explain it real quick for just a second. At the same time, yeah, from left to right. The reason I didn't write it out as a word, P E N D A S, I wrote it as like a vertical structure. P, parentheses, it is the back daddy of everything that we might write down in mathematics as far as order. In fact, we could eliminate everything and just use parentheses, but we don't. So how do we get rid of some of these parentheses? Well, then we then respect exponents above everything else, right? You're going to do an exponent before you do multiplication, which we talked about before a squared. You can do multiplication division from left to right. If you see division before multiplication, that, divide those two things, okay? And then again, division is fraction. 